God's house. We have a lot of folks that are not able to be here today, a lot of sickness going on. And so I want us to just pause here. And if you look around, maybe catch, we, not everybody has to think of everybody, but if you'll just think of one person or two people that you notice aren't here with us today, it's very likely that they're out sick. Would you just lift your hand to heaven for a moment, call out to the Lord and call that person's name and ask the Lord just to touch them, touch their body, Lord, minister healing to them. And also pray that God would minister strength to their mind, their emotions. Come on, somebody go ahead and do that right now. Lord, we thank you for the touch of heaven. We thank you for the family, the body of Christ. And Lord, we miss those that are not with us today. Every person that is out sick, Lord, would you visit with them? Would you heal them and strengthen their body? And Lord, minister to their spirit man as well. Lord, that part of them that only you can touch, do it in the name of Jesus. Somebody just shout in Jesus' name. good to see all of you, and it's good to have our guests. If you're a guest of New Life, New Life, why don't we just let them know for a moment how glad we are that you're here. Amen. Amen. So, so wonderful to have each of you. If this is your first time visiting with us, we will, you will hear it often, um, but we ask you to take our Take Six Challenge. We are a spirit-led church. That means that just anything's possible and just about every service is going to be just a little bit different and so we want you to make the best decision you can make regarding your walk of faith and who it is that you surround yourself in that walk of faith and so uh, we ask you to take six opportunities visit with us be with us get to know us experience what we experience together in this place and outside of this place and then make a decision on whether or not this would be the church that you decide to have as your home church. So the take six challenge, turn to your neighbor and say, take six. And that applies to the saints in here today because we also have a take six challenge for the saints and that is on your way out the door. You'll see the poster before you leave. Uh, take six of our invite cards and make sure we are, uh, there are many elements to evangelism and discipleship and this is probably the least of these. But it is part of the process that we ought to get uh, adapted to and that is making sure we're inviting and bringing people to the house of God. Anybody love in this place, and you're a home folk, anybody love being in God's house when we gather together? Just never ceases to amaze me when I walk through that door, what God gets up to, what he does, and what we experience. Turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Mark chapter 3. Begin at verse number 1. Mark chapter 3. mention to you that next Sunday is our missions pledge Sunday and we are also having a ministry fair at the end of the service where uh, we're going to highlight all of the different things just about everything we could think of that we 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 need to do for the church to be the church on site off site uh, many areas where you can volunteer where you can get involved highlight those things and just have a good time of fellowship following service. So please be here in attendance and uh, be thinking ways. If, if you're not already, be thinking ways you could be connected because you are very valuable to the kingdom of God and to this church, to this pastor and family. Amen. Uh, turn to somebody and say, you're valuable. I don't, I don't care if this is your first Sunday or your thousand and first Sunday. You are valuable. Amen to the kingdom. Mark chapter 3 and verse 1 says, And he entered again into the synagogue. Speaking of Jesus, there was a man there that had a withered hand, and they watched him whether he would heal him. This is talking about the religious people of the day were watching Jesus whether he would heal this man with the withered hand on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. Verse 3, And he saith unto the man, which had the withered hand, stand forth. Somebody say, stand forth. And I'd like to pause right there and tell you that the Lexham English Bible renders verse 3 this way. He said to the man who had the withered hand, come or step into the middle. Somebody say, into the middle. Picking back up at verse 4 in the King James. He says, and he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace, and when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. 
and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You can put your Bibles down, and I want to invite you one more time this morning before the word to pray and ask the Lord to minister to you and to your family and to this church body in the name of Jesus. Would you do that, Father? We thank you for the word of the Lord. Now open our eyes and our ears, enlighten some things through your word that it would practically apply to our lives in this moment in the name of Jesus. God, every person of faith in this room, I pray that you would minister through your word, strengthen the body of Christ, heal us, O oh God, in every way that we, we know we can receive from you. We bring every thought, we bring every need to you, and we open it up to you, asking, surrendering, Lord, it is in your hands. Minister today the powerful and wondrous work of heaven in every heart, every family, in this church body. In the name of Jesus, one more time shout, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you greet someone, hug their neck, high five, let them know how glad you are to see them in God's house today. Somebody called the police. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to talk to you this morning from the subject, the miracle in the middle. Somebody say the miracle in the middle. I wanted to preach this Sunday on the curse of a worthy portion. I think the Lord is directing me to do that next Sunday. Um, and I, I am preaching today a message I've actually preached here. It's been like three years or so since I've preached it. And over the course of this week, just could not get away from what I felt the Lord pressing upon me to share. So as much as I would like to preach something new today, and trust me, I've got at least four messages ready right now that I could preach. Don't want anybody thinking I ain't getting getting work done. You know what I'm saying? I could preach to you. I haven't preached for, for two months. I've had what about the baker? Uh, come in a few weeks. I'm probably going to preach that. I'm just trying to set the hook. If you don't like today, hopefully something I say, title will at least catch your attention. I want to preach to you soon about I'll take the well. Thought about preaching, just keep the light. But today I'm preaching because I feel the mandate of heaven is putting a pause on those words and preaching to you the miracle in the middle. Now, I don't see it as much anymore, but when I was a kid, one of the things that I used to love about cereal, I think I mentioned this uh, not too long ago, my wife loves cereal. Everybody kind of knows that I've mentioned it. My wife will rather eat cereal on a Sunday night for dinner than just about anything. It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I enjoy cereal as kind of a side, an extra, almost a dessert. But I'm just telling you, when it's time for dinner, cereal is not an adequate replacement. You can probably tell by looking at me that that's, you know, that makes sense. But uh, when I was a kid, one of the things that I loved about the cereal wasn't even the brand. It wasn't the specific flavor of the cereal although uh, I still love me some Lucky Charms and some Captain Crunch. But, uh, come on, somebody. <laughs> but that, that wasn't what I was crazy about. As a kid, it, it certainly wasn't the small print that was on the back of the boxes where you find out the carbs and the calories and, the, and all that stuff, and I still don't care a whole lot about that. Hallelujah. But what I would get excited about a new box of cereal, there were just two words really that would determine whether I was going to love that brand or that flavor, and those two words were prize inside. Upon reading those two words, understand, regardless of whether I just come in from playing baseball with sweaty arms and dirty hands, I was going to reach down in the middle of that box and I was going to dig around until I could find the prize contained within that box of cereal. And what was left was often a ripped bag and a deformed box and a countertop covered with scattered cereal. But after I got hold of that, that was what I was after. Once I got the prize in the middle of that box, I was good to go. And I would probably pour out some cereal and eat some. And, but I, I, and I read, by the way, that prizes are now kind of something they've done away with because they're choking hazards. I just feel so sorry for the children of this generation. But I love the prize in the middle. And there are still many things in life that the best part 
is what is in the middle. And, and I know it's going to be a recurring theme here for a moment, but they will often be associated with food. But I'm just going to tell you right now, I, Oreo cookies, it's what's in the middle that counts to me. Okay? I still love some Swiss rolls. That, that I don't know what that cream is, but my goodness. How, anybody loves some raspberry donuts, the feeling, the Boston cream? It's what's in the middle of that. Everything else is okay, but in the middle is where it's at. Amen. Now, on the adverse, there are things in life that you just can't wait to get out of the middle of, like for all the college students and the and the, and the high school students, you can't wait to get out of the middle of math class. Or for me, I, I don't find myself in the middle of this very often, but I can't wait to get out of the middle of a five-mile run. In fact, I have to be honest, I'm in the pulpit. I should be honest everywhere, but especially in the pulpit. I don't think I've ever been on a five-mile run, so let me just clarify that. I can imagine that if you were stuck in the middle of traffic between a bunch of motorcycle gang members and your horn got stuck, you'd probably want to get out of the middle of that real quick. And close to this getting out of illustration, there are events and times in the serious areas of our life that when we're in the middle of that thing, we just cannot wait to get to the other side of what's taking place in our life. Anybody been there a time or two? While going through it, you were sure it was the worst thing that had ever happened to you. But you found that when you made it to the other side, you realized that it was perhaps some of the best things that could have ever happened to you. Because the struggle in the middle of that issue made you stronger. And what you went through made you wiser. It gave you wisdom. The conflict produced in you a sort of confidence. The fact is that life is filled with middle moments, those in-between places. Some have called them life's waiting rooms. That place in between the promise and the blessing. Those moments in between the prophetic word and the wonder of its fulfillment. Those days and months and sometimes even years in between the ambition and the accomplishment but I want to tell the church today, there is a miracle in the middle. As we look throughout the scriptures, we find our greatest heroes of faith and our favorite, some of our favorite Bible characters dealing with these middle moments. Abraham spends 25 years, if you will, in the middle. It was 25 years between the time that God promised Abraham fruitfulness and when the promised seed Isaac was actually born. 25 years. Think about that. It would be 13 years from the moment that Joseph was placed in the pit before he finally ascended to the palace. 13 years of abuse and betrayal and false accusations that filled the time between a dream and a destiny fulfilled. The middle for Moses was 40 years. 40 years on the backside of the desert tending to sheep. One of my favorite Bible characters, David, it was 15 years that separated the moment that David would be anointed as the next king of Israel and the time that he would actually ascend to the throne of Israel. And yet we understand also that in these situations, all of them, Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David, while we celebrate what they would become when they came to the other side, it was the forging of their character and their faith and their trust in God while in the middle of that mess. That even made the miracle we celebrate on the other side possible. This morning, I'm just going to move right into the text that we've read from Mark chapter 3 to illustrate the point further. This same occasion that we read of Mark 3 is captured in Matthew 12 and Luke chapter 6. Gleaning from the various records of the gospel writers, we are made aware that this man would soon be the recipient of the healing work of Jesus. And this man that would receive a miracle is here in the synagogue and he is dealing with the limitations of a withered hand. We would gain further understanding of his exact disability when we study that word withered 
just a little further. It's from a Greek participle, and the Greek participle for the word that is used there for withered describes that it was a hand that had become withered or a hand that had been caused to be paralyzed. In other words, this man was not born with the calamity. It hadn't always been that way, but along the line, some illness, some tragedy had left him broken. How long? We're not certain. Likely it's been years, perhaps the majority of his lifetime. But what we do know is that some sickness, illness, some tragedy or event has left him hampered and hindered with a withered hand. As the reader, we know the end of the story. We know that this man will be well again. He's been well before. He'll be well again. But right now, he's in the middle. As I mentioned before, in between the tragedy and the triumph, in between the mess and the miracle, in between the hurt and the healing. But just as with Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David, I'm here to preach to somebody today, it's what you do in the middle that will make the difference. And I know it seems a little odd and, and, and out of the norm for just a moment because normally we are preaching about the miracle and we're building faith for the miracle and we're believing for healing and deliverance and breakthrough. And you know me, I certainly believe in all of that today and we'll get to it in a moment. But there are times that the greatest miracle is not what we will be on the other side, but it is what God is going to do in us, to us, and through us while we're still in the middle. It is what I call the progress of God's process. And the first key to what this man does that brings about the miracle in the middle deals with his location. It's not a major point, but I just can't get past it without mentioning it here today. It was what qualified him. He was in the synagogue. Somebody shout, location matters. Dealing with the effects of the tragedy of his life, but still in church. Oh, come on, somebody. She's not here today. She's sick, perhaps with strep, some strain of strep throat. It just impressed me. She may be watching online, so I'll, I'll say it. Hopefully she'll hear it, and I'll get some brownie points. But Sister Kristen was here on Friday evening with some of her family, and she was cleaning the church while she was sick. It stunned me that, that someone wouldn't just call and say, hey, can somebody else take care of this? It's, it's something important to me when we can press through some things and be where we're supposed to be. I know we had an evangelist last week, and, and pastor might get a little gritty. Get ready to get a little gritty here. It was where he was that qualified him for a miraculous healing. Now, I don't have to go back in my mind too far ago, just about three years or so ago, when we were thrust into stay-at-home orders. And for our church, it was about 10 Sundays of online church and Sundays of preaching to empty chairs in the sanctuary, not getting to worship with the rest of the church. And I hope that you are still like me. I promised myself in the middle of that, and I still guarantee to myself today, I'll never take a... Never again take for granted the great privilege to be in God's house. Come on, somebody. It feels good to be in the house of the Lord. It feels good to worship with fellow believers. But more than just feeling good, my Bible tells me that we're two or three are gathered together in my name. I will be in their midst. It's about more than just feeling good. When you make it into the house of the Lord, you are a candidate for a miracle. Don't misunderstand. We can get the miraculous elsewhere, but one of the key components is coming to God's house because when you're in God's house, where God's at and God's people are at, you are positioned for a breakthrough. Hallelujah. If you're here today, and some event, some moment in your past has left you withered and wilted. It might be physical or it might be emotional. It might be down in the depth of who you are. I'm telling you, real estate says location. Come on, location. Lo 
location, location. They're trying to stress a fact. It matters where you are. Can I tell you why you ought to be at church? Somebody shout the anointing. You ought to come to church because here is where you're going to encounter the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that it is the anointing, man, I feel it on me right now, that breaks every yoke. Turn your neighbor and say, break the yoke. Come on. The Bible says that ye who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Can I preach to the church for a minute? We don't need to be led by the flesh. Come on, hear me. This kind of getting into next week's message. But they, hear me. The enemy is not after our talents and our flesh and our gifts. Somebody say it again. Break the yoke. Hear me. Hear me. Watch this. The enemy is not after your gift. He's not after your abilities. He's not after your talents. He's not after your wisdom. He's not after your insight. He's not after your degree or your education. The Bible says that when David was coronated as the king of a unified kingdom, the Philistines, the enemy, standing in the distance, reasoned together, we must conquer David now because we hear he is anointed. I'll say it again, the enemy doesn't care about your gift and your talent, but you want to know how to engage the greatest enemy of your soul, you let the anointing rest on you for a minute. I'm just going to say it this way. Some of you are in the middle right now. Some of you are going through some stuff right now. And that's why some of you are encountering the stuff you're encountering is because there's an anointing on you. That's why this week I have met with and been on the phone with from Tuesday all the way through Saturday for hours at a time talking to precious saints in this church that are facing things, some unthinkable things, other things that confidentiality would not even permit me to tell you. Come on, somebody, for some of you, hear me. He's capitalizing on mistakes of your flesh, and then for others, he's trying to attack some weaknesses in our flesh and in our bodies, and I'm convinced it's because this church has promise and anointing on it right now. Because the Bible says there is an anointing that comes on you that will destroy the yoke of the adversary. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the touch and the witness of heaven. I know some things... And for some of you, I don't know what kind of bondage you're in. But can I remind you, the gift that makes you free is not some double portion of your flesh or some education or some, I'm not against education or gifts. I'm not against ability. But what gets the enemy's attention is when the anointing shows up. When the Bible says the anointing destroys, destroys the yoke, now, this is all new. I preached the message a few years ago. This part's new. I had to do that because my wife said she was going to go home. I tease her a little bit. Brother Daniel, she's heard this message. She heard it three years ago here. But since the Lord has used me to preach it all over the country, several different places, and, and, and like four times in the last six months, so she's heard everything I got to say for the most part. So I said, we're going to throw a little curveball. See, she's paying attention today. No, 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 listen to me. This is for now. This is for right now. The general message will apply any time. But for right now, the Bible, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is directing me to the Scripture. When the Bible says that the anointing destroys the yoke, listen, it doesn't just break it. We misquote this thing all the time. It destroys it. And here's what I want to share, and then I'll move on. The picture of what the anointing does parallels the oxen 
the, the image of what he's dealing with in the scripture. Oxen that are working the field. The farmer comes along and with a yoke he binds those oxen together because two are better than one. But they are under the control of the one who holds the reins on these beasts of burden. They're in the field. They've got that bit in their mouth. And they feel the heaviness and the burden of the yoke going wherever whoever is holding the rope tells them to go. Can I just stop right here? I feel in the Holy Ghost to say something. Sin starts as a decision by you. But sin will always end with an enemy of your soul in charge of the reins. You better be careful what flesh gets you into. Because your flesh cannot get you out of it. That's why we don't need a double portion of our flesh. That's why we can't afford to walk in our flesh. We've got to walk after the Spirit. That was free. That was just extra. While the yoke is on the oxen, it is the parallel to the anointing. And the Bible says it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. The translated version in a modern text says it this way. It is that the oxen, watch this. We're talking about increase. It is that the oxen become so fat with favor that it shatters whatever it is that is keeping it bound. Hallelujah. You're just navigating through life, working like you always worked, but suddenly the anointing comes on you. Suddenly the power of the Holy Ghost visits you. And see, the enemy doesn't care who you are or what family you're from or what your pedigree is or what your gifts are and what your talents are. He just wants to prevent the anointing from working on you. But the Bible says when the anointing comes on that yoke, hallelujah, it gives the image of the oxen in the field becoming fat with favor that the yoke just shatters under the growth of the anointing. Hear me tonight today. God is about to do something in this assembly. God is about to do something in this community. Not through a double portion of our abilities. Not through greater aspects of our flesh. But God's anointing. I prophesy to this city there is a witness in this community that is fat with favor. Increase is upon us. Hallelujah. And the things that have controlled us by the enemy, not only will we be free, but the yoke is going to be destroyed. My, 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 my. I, one of these days, and I feel for some of you it's going to be very quick. Some of us, you're going to be walking around, and all of a sudden, snap, there goes the yoke. Hallelujah. Come on. You're going to be living life, coming to the right place, getting in the presence of God, and all of a sudden, pop. There goes that brokenness. And all of a sudden, pop, there goes that disease. Come on. All of a sudden, snap, and there goes that bondage. All of a sudden. Why? I was in the right location. I visited with the anointing. The residue of God's blessing fell upon me, and I am fat with favor. I'm trying to tell you it matters where you are. Because though you can have the anointing out there, it should follow. This is a place of abundant overflow. Get to the house of God. Why? There's great anointing there. Oh, Jesus, help me preach for just a minute. I can't spend a lot of more time here, but I feel to just in the Holy Ghost begin to step out and just begin to allow the ministry of the Lord to do what he wants to do. Brother Lyons, would you stand up right now? In the name of Jesus, I profess the anointing is going to break the yoke. I profess the anointing is going to work in the middle. I profess the anointing is going to... 
Come on, somebody, let your faith arise right now. I feel the Holy Ghost on me. Stephanie, stand up right now. Come on, it's the anointing. It's going to touch your mind. It's going to grant wisdom. Why? It's the anointing. Kate, stand up right now. I know you've been through the valley. I know you've gone through some things, but there is an anointing on your life, and it's the anointing that's going to elevate above every other circumstance. Somebody get a hold of what God's doing right now. Somebody just press in the Holy Ghost for a minute, would you? I feel the touch of heaven. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let the anointing flow through you right now. Would you go to somebody that's sitting beside you and just pray and let the touch of heaven operate in this place for just a moment? Sister Claudine, I feel like God's telling me the anointing is going to break that thing your sister's facing in the name of Jesus. It's not going to come through the wisdom of man, but it's going to come by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Brother Mark, stand up. Come on, stand up in the name of Jesus. The anointing do its work. Touch the body. Heal. Come on, press for just a moment. Would you lift your voice, people of God? Come on, apostolics, just lift your voice for a moment. Hallelujah. 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 I invite somebody right now, pray. God, let your anointing rest upon me like I've never experienced it before. God, remove the things of my flesh that are trying to get in the way of the anointing having full reign in my spirit. Come on, God wants to break some bondage off of people. God wants to bring some deliverance to your mind. God wants to bring some breakthrough to your soul. And it's going to come through the anointing. You're going to have to put the areas of your flesh on hold. You're going to have to tell your mind and, your, and the battles of your mind to remove themselves from the forefront. And let God's anointing begin to clarify and bring peace in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me hurry just for a few moments longer. I feel the Holy Ghost ministering. I know he's not done. The man with this withered hand, his location was vital. And the next thing I would share with you, Jesus speaks to the man with the withered hand and calls for him to stand forth. Remember when I asked you to repeat stand forth when we were reading the text, I said, say stand forth. Everybody said stand forth. And then I read to you from the Lexham English Bible. And it says... Step into the middle. His location was the first step. And now God's dealing with his position. So here, think about it. Coping with the withered hand. Jesus calls the man to step into the middle. Now, there are several different scriptural positions that would lead us to believe that, that, that this man would want to be anywhere but in the middle. We know that it was common misconception, common wrong belief, but belief nonetheless that physical ailments and deformities were the result of some sin in this day. In John 9 and 2, when Jesus and the disciples encounter a blind man, the disciples ask, who sinned that this man should be born blind? Likely the man is there simply desiring to blend in that day partake of the Sabbath ceremonies with everybody else, just wanting to fit in with the crowd. Now, when we were a smaller church, it was harder to do that, but I can tell that by the larger we grow, sometimes we get the same kind of mentality. I just want to blend in. Many commentaries cite two passages in Leviticus chapter 21 and 18 where the Lord speaks to Moses 
stating that a person dealing with any physical defect cannot serve as a priest. In 2 Samuel 5 and verse 8, King David appears to extend the exclusion of the lame and the halt being allowed into the temple. Aren't you thankful that things are different? Hallelujah. Other passages recorded in the gospel seem to uphold the thought that this man with the withered hand shouldn't have even been in the synagogue because of the rules. And isn't that just like Jesus? We hope to go to church and just blend in. Already feeling sometimes like we don't fit in with all the other religious folks that have got everything just right. And then God, it's like he just puts a spotlight right on us. Just <laughs> Preacher does everything but call out your name and sometimes he even does that like just a few minutes ago. Right, Kate? The last place we want to be is dragging our, our stuff our privacy, our mess into the middle. And so we often will pray, God, just why me? Why me? Why did you make the preacher preach right at me? Everybody knows he was preaching to me. How many ever thought that before? It couldn't be further from the truth. Everybody else is saying the same thing. Dear God in heaven, what, where can I hide? Just like the Lord. Can I just stop right here and say, if that's you, today, I want you to know there's only one reason that Jesus ever calls people into the middle. And that's because he's got a miracle for them. I've come to preach to somebody that's been called into the middle. You're here today feeling like you're caught in the middle. In the middle of a circumstance that has you confused. In the middle of a trial that has you overwhelmed. I'm, I'm touching, I'm flowing in the ghost right now. In the middle of conflict that you cannot see any way out. But I'm here to tell you the miracle came for this man in the middle. Somebody needs to hear it. God loves you too much to leave you in the comfort of your compromise. And so God's saying you need to step out of that mess. He cares about us too much to let us blend in when we're broken. And so he says, come on, child, i got something for you. Somebody shout location. Somebody shout position. And I'm not going to preach very long, but I want to tell you how the miracle comes when you're in the middle may feel like you're being put on the spot today just because you're in the middle and the miracle comes in the middle. There are two keys remaining to the healing of the man with the withered hand in our text. Remember, the first two important steps have to do with his location and his position in the house of God and in the middle. But the two remaining primary keys I want to share today that leads to his healing deal with, somebody shout, his response. Now, I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the man with the withered hand. This man's response, the first deals with his response to Jesus. And the second deals with his response to his circumstance. Number one, firstly, Jesus tells him, stretch forth thine hand. This is where we deal with the response to Jesus. Stretch forth thine hand. Now recently, well, I guess now it's been a few years. But when I read this story a few years ago, first putting the message together, probably read it for the 150th time. For the first time, this point jumped off the page at me. He said, stretch forth thine hand. But Jesus did not tell him which hand to stretch forth. He just said, stretch forth thine hand. Pastor, what, what, what do you mean? I, I'm going to talk to us for a minute. He could have stretched out the good hand. He could have presented the strong hand, the one that was still whole. And I've got to tell us, there are some times that the power of God begins to move in a service. And I feel the presence of God tugging at my heart. And as pastor, I see him doing the same to many of us, asking us to stretch forth our hands. And in our hearts, we know what God is looking for. And in our hearts, we know what God is asking for. He's asking for what is withered. And we're trying to give him what is whole. He's looking for my brokenness. And instead, I'm trying to present my best. 
He's asking for my tragedy, and I'm trying to present my triumph. He's asking for my impurity, and I'm holding up my self-righteous garments. He's asking for that hidden sin, and I'm trying to stretch forth my religious resume as if I've got it all together. How many times does Jesus come to produce real change in our lives. And we want to pretend he's talking about the other hand. Like everything's all good and I got everything together and I'm, I'm just a wonderful Christian and I'm, I'm Patty Pentecostal and I'm just, everything's just right. As a pastor, I see it happen on a weekly basis sometimes. Things that I know people are dealing with and God comes to minister to that very need and we do anything but surrender that area. He comes to produce healing and salvation and redemption and instead of allowing him to work on what is wrong, we're presenting everything we have that's right. I know that area of my life he's one to work on. I know that part of this man that is fractured and broken. But hear me, God is not going to force on you. He's going to leave it up to you. I'm here. I'm ready to heal and to make whole. I know the condition you're in, but it's up to you. Stretch forth your hand. America came because he knew what Jesus was asking for and he did not withhold. He was willing to stretch forth what his source of brokenness was instead of what he could boast about. Can I just tell you there are times in our, in our church and we have a wonderful church and we, we felt it today, God moving. But there are times, saints, you hear me, that God is trying to break through and we are just waiting for the end of the song and the next part of the service. And let's get through the prayer moment. And we're going to just do the declaration. And the pastor's going to preach. And we're going to respond for a few minutes. And then we're going to go home or we're going to go out to eat. And I feel the Holy Ghost saying, stop right here and tell them. Come on, that's us trying to put the whole stuff out. And God's saying, there's so much broken. There's so much stuff that I could do and minister if my people would just forget about the next thing coming. Forget about the protocol and the three songs and this and, and that and the, and the condition. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to tell you the Holy Ghost is saying, I want to break forth, but you're trying to act like everything's okay. Every Sunday, 39 minutes, give me five more minutes. I'm taking them whether you give them or not, but I just want to be nice. Every Sunday, Brother Lucas, we have a pause in the service for the specific purpose of prayer and I still I'm old fashioned I still believe that anything is possible I still believe God can do anything work any miracle touch any life redeem any person but sometimes instead of everybody flooding to the front saying I need something from God I see it I see it on us well I don't want to I don't want anyone to think anything this Sunday about it. Or, well, I, it's not that big of a deal. Anything. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost wants that moment in our service. He wants the anointing to take over so that it can break all kind of stuff. And I am inviting you. I'm not, I, I'm not trying to get on you. I'm inviting you to understand that that is the moment we need to make up our mind. I'm going to surrender everything. I don't care if it's a broken toenail. Well, maybe that's a little extreme. I don't care if it's a broken toe. By the way, broken toenails can get serious. You better get that thing checked out. I don't care how minor it may seem to you. That's the moment that we ought to all come with a surrendered heart saying, God, I know I don't have it all together. I know that in this human condition there are imperfections you want to work on. So I'm coming with an open heart. God, pour out upon me favor that will break the yoke. Pour out upon me anointing that will destroy. I'm 
was done. The miracle came because he knew what Jesus was asking for, and he did not withhold. He was willing to stretch forth what was his source of brokenness. How much more could Jesus do in our lives? And how much further would we be in our growth and healing if we would just get honest and put forth the areas that need healing instead of extending the parts that we feel like we've already got that all together and it's a good show for everybody else? The two keys. His response to Jesus, stretch forth thine hand. He stretched forth what was broken. And finally, it deals with his miracle coming because of his response to that circumstance in the first place. The Bible tells us that this man stretched forth his withered hand, and when he did, did you catch this little component? Anybody remember what happened when he stretched forth his hand? It became whole. Is that it? It became whole. As whole as the other hand. The Bible says that when he stretched forth his withered hand, when he did, the withered hand was restored whole. As the other. I want to state that phrase one more time. And I want you to listen to it and think about what it's saying. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. The restored condition of his withered hand was connected to the condition of the other hand. Let me say it like this. His miracle was limited to what he did with what remained. What he did not do let me say it this way. He could not, what he did not know is that the entire time he had been in the middle, he, somebody shout he, he had been quantifying his own miracle. Jesus, have mercy. You see, many times when tragedy or brokenness comes in our lives, we don't live up to what is left. We live down to what is lost. I'm talking right now. We focus on what we lost instead of exercising what we've got left. Instead of lifting and living up to our faith, we live down to our failures and our circumstance. I've watched people experience one hurt and their whole lives become bitter. One person lets them down. It affects every relationship. Come on, come on. One issue. A family member struggles and they walk away from God. chapter 3. Jesus speaks to the church at Sardis and he tells them, strengthen the things which remain. The enemy may have robbed me of something, but he did not take everything. And until my miracle comes, and until what I've lost is restored, I'm going to strengthen what remains. Oh, I know some of you are going through it right now. I know some of you are waiting on the miracle, but I feel in the Holy Ghost to tell you it matters what you do in the meantime. It matters the attitude you have in the meantime. It matters the praise and the prayers you exercise in the meantime. Come on, elevate your faith. Elevate your, your passion. Elevate your desire. And watch God do something. Please hear me for a moment. Some of you may remember me saying this before, but I'll say it here. It bears saying right here. God is not going to give you a Popeye miracle. Anybody remember that? You know Popeye, not chicken. Sometimes it's a miracle if you go there, you even get food. Popeye, I'm talking about. 
by the sailor man, right? The most deformed body in the history of mankind. Massive forearms and the skinniest, puniest little body. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Eats his spinach. So many of us want God to give us Popeye miracles. But God, hear me. God isn't going to give you a miracle that leaves you out of balance. He ain't going to do it. He ain't going to restore a bunch of health to something when there's other areas you ain't surrendered. I'm preaching to people here today, and I feel this so strong, that because you have not quit in the middle, because you didn't live down to failure, because you didn't allow your joy to shrivel up and die when you heard the news. And when the doctor's report came, oh, I feel the touch of heaven. Hallelujah. There may be times where you've even felt like you've lost your song, but you refused to let go of your shout. You refused to let go of your dance. Come on, and I'm here. I feel the Holy Ghost say it. Just bear with the process because a miracle is coming of you today that are here and you're in the middle right now and you've lost some things or you feel like you're losing some things and you're dealing with withered circumstances but your miracle is going to be defined by what, by what you do in the middle. And right now you could turn and walk out the doors stretching forth your good hand and hiding what is broken and withered acting like you don't need to run to the altar or you could surrender what you need to Jesus and let him begin to work on it you could walk out of here continuing to live down to tragedy or to failure or you could stretch forth that broken hand that withered circumstance and instead of living down live up to your faith Come on, there's some yoke that needs to be broken in this place, and it's only the anointing. I'm just going to tell you right now, the altars are open. I'm done. If you have something you need from God, and you're ready to say, I surrender it all completely to you. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care about what anybody says. I don't care the actions of anybody else. I'm not going to let myself or someone else hinder my miracle that God's working in me right now. Come on, I know the enemy's done everything he came to destroy you, but I feel the Holy Ghost telling you, you're stronger than you thought you were. Be lifted high in this place. Devil knows you shouldn't even be here today, but you're here, and the Holy Ghost is moving right now. Nothing else will do. He's going to make what is withered and broken holy. Chains are broken, eyes are open, miracles are in this place, hearts are mended, grace extended, miracles are Come on, miracles are in this place, but some of it's up to you. Surrender it. Turn it completely to him. Lord, hear our cry. Cast your cares upon me. You've got to trust his care a lot more than you do. In this place. you got to know he knows a lot more than you do. Lord, we want you. Nothing else will do. Chains are broken, eyes are open, miracles are in this place. Hearts are mended, grace extended, miracles are in this place. Chains are
Yeah. Uh-huh. 